Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. For such a time as this may very well be the apt phrase when it comes to the title of this morning's message. As it is, the title is uh, considerably longer, as you have seen. Pray for wisdom, strive for unity, maintain the bond of peace, love one another deeply. Wisdom, unity, peace and love. Perhaps now more than ever, that is what the church in Australia needs. As we seek to honour God, we will do so only as we apply godly wisdom to the situation that we, and indeed the church throughout Australia, currently finds herself in. We all experienced, didn't we, the earthquake that shook the ground under our feet two Wednesday mornings ago. The same day, we witnessed the smouldering tension of more than 1,000 people suddenly explode at the Shrine of Remembrance. The truth is that unless we as human beings have something stronger keeping us together, like the earthquake and like the scenes at the Shrine, tension eventually explodes. Pressure sooner or later, has to be released. The Christian community, however, can live even with tension when the world around it cannot. We can live with it because God holds us. He he carries us and promises never to leave us nor forsake us. He doesn't ordinarily lift us out of the tension, but rather holds us through the tension. There is no doubt that the tension that we have had to endure, and and some of you for a whole lot longer than I have myself, that it isn't over just yet. There is still some way to go, isn't there? The question is, will it end up exploding as it did under our feet as the earth shook, or at the shrine as two opposing sides collided? Or will we trust the God who holds us in his hands can be trusted to bring us safely through. We are faced, aren't we, with very difficult choices. Difficult choices as individuals, difficult choices as families perhaps, difficult choices as a church. Do we or do we not choose to get the vaccine? You as an individual must make that choice, not a moral choice, Now let's be clear about that. Taking the vaccine or not taking the vaccine is in no way a moral choice, not in and of itself in any case. But it is a choice that most of us sooner or later must make. And the reasons for taking the vaccine or not will be based upon a whole range of criteria. Safety concerns, our own fragile health, our regard for ourselves and others, our trust of government perhaps, what we read and who we listen to, personal and public freedoms and our livelihoods, the ability to gather with others as mandated by our government and a whole range of other issues besides. And as far as the choices you make are concerned, in no way at all do I seek to be prescriptive. Whilst I have chosen to be vaccinated, you might choose not to be. There is no right or wrong answer that can be applied to everyone. There is no right or wrong answer that can be applied to the church. It is neither a sin to choose to be vaccinated or to choose not to be vaccinated. 
What we all need, therefore, is wisdom. We need, as the people of God, to choose wisely and to be careful not to impose our views, my view, upon others. Our task throughout all of the turmoil, the turmoil that we've already been through and the turmoil, no doubt, that is yet to come, is to maintain a unity and a peace despite the choices that we may have made as individuals. We should never forget that as followers of the Lord Jesus, we serve one God and are members of one family. There are, however, consequences to the choices we make. Not, e not eternal consequences. And again, we need to be very clear about that. What we do with the gospel has eternal consequences. Saying yes or no to Jesus, that has eternal consequences. Choosing to pick up our cross and follow him or choosing not to, that has eternal consequences. Choosing to be vaccinated or choosing not to be vaccinated does not. Let me say that again. Choosing to be vaccinated or choosing not to be vaccinated does not have eternal consequences. We have fellowship with one another based upon our reception of the gospel and upon nothing else, not our position in society, not our skin colour, not our political persuasion, not our sex, not our background, not our maturity or immaturity in the faith, not our understanding of eschatology and definitely not our vaccination status. Our fellowship with one another is based upon none of that. What it is based upon and what it is grounded in is our reception of the gospel. The gospel alone invites us to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And only the gospel does that. Choosing to be vaccinated or choosing not to be vaccinated should not and must not be allowed to come between anyone who is a Christian. What our choices in this regard will have, however, are temporal consequences. Not because we want that to be the case, but because the laws that have been posed upon the citizens of Victoria by the lawful authorities has mandated that they will. And sometimes, and in some cases, because our health is fragile. And as this season plays out, we hope that it will be only for a time. And hopefully the time will soon pass. But the truth is, we just don't know do we just how long this is going to play out in the lives of men and women and communities and churches at at this stage is uncertain what we must deal with at the present time and not in three months time or six months time but now is what do we do given the choices that we as individuals and that we as as families and most importantly as a church have for the past uh, several weeks, and certainly in my case for considerably longer than that, the elders and now the leadership team has had to wrestle with this and a number of other issues that, that we, quite frankly, really didn't want to have to wrestle with. We recognise that in a church family our size, there will be any number of positions. Now, some of those positions are immo immovable. We know that. Others will be flexible and over time choices will shift. But not everyone is going to come to the same conclusion that I've come to. Not in this church and not in any church. We understand that in not too many weeks from now as the Victorian population reaches the 70% fully vaccinated threshold and, and shortly after that the 80% fully vaccinated threshold that the church must decide what it is going to do now the simple answer is this we as a church will seek to stay within the guidelines that have been set by the governing authorities the restrictions that have been mandated provide for us a framework in which the leadership team and and therefore the church 
can move forward. Up until now, making decisions has been fairly easy to do. Painful, but easy. Easy in the sense that the application of government restrictions have been across the board and have been applied equally and to everyone. When we've been told we cannot meet, we have been told no one can meet. You cannot meet with me and I cannot meet with you. Painful, but all-inclusive. At 70% and at 80%, however, it begins to change. Restrictions will ease somewhat for those who have been vaccinated, but not so much for those who choose not to be vaccinated or who perhaps cannot be vaccinated. And as a church family, we must choose what we are going to do. And so how do we do that? Well, the first thing we must do is think theologically. Now, I've said that before, haven't I? We need to be careful to listen to what God is saying and, and not be swayed by all of the voices that strive to silence him. All of the voices that strive to drown God out. All of the voices that have no regard for him. Now, there are going to be some issues that confront us that the task of, of hearing God speak isn't very hard. He's spoken clearly, for instance, when it, when it comes to how a person must be saved. You know, the world can say what it likes, and it will say what it likes. But God has spoken. Salvation is found in no one else. Jesus is the only way to come into the presence of God. Not Jesus and something, just Jesus. We know what God has said regarding human sexuality. We know what God has said regarding the sanctity of, of human life. We know what God has said regarding marriage. We know what God has said regarding sin and repentance. And so there is a great deal that we do know. How do we know? Well, God has spoken and he has spoken clearly. But what is God saying regarding the situation that the church currently finds herself in? Well, the answer isn't so clear, is it? Now, we might have an opinion. We might have a feeling. I have a feeling. Stephen, as I've been speaking to him over the past couple of weeks, he has a feeling. Rod has a feeling. I have a desire to meet with all of my brothers and sisters, and I want to do it now. Not tomorrow, not next week. I want to do it now. That's how I feel. And most of you also have a burning desire to meet with your brothers and sisters. But what is God saying to us? What we would all like, I'm sure, is to have a letter written to us, much like those John wrote to the seven churches in the, in the book of Revelation. A letter that begins with the words, to the church in Beaconsfield. To the church in Beaconsfield, concerning COVID, I have this to say. But we don't. And the truth is that no church does. That does not mean, however, that we don't have direction. God has given to us his word. He, he has given to us his spirit. He has given to us mature Christian brothers and sisters to help us think it through. And together they serve to shine a light into the darkness of uncertainty and help direct our path. And so what we need to do is think it through prayerfully and theologically. We need to pray for wisdom. We need to respond always with grace, knowing that God will guide his people. He will not leave us on our own. Do you believe that? And so we need to ask the question, what is pleasing to God? What would our Father have us do? How would, how would he have me respond? How would he have us respond? What choice will serve to honour God first and foremost? And that may well be that the choices that, that I make in this regard will be different than the choices that you make. And almost certainly there are going to be disagreements. Disagreements in a church this size really isn't a surprise. And it's certainly nothing to be afraid of. 
But in the course of those disagreements, maintaining the spirit of unity in the bond of peace should always be the goal. Let me say that again. Maintaining the spirit of unity in the bond of peace should always be the goal. Why? Because our future as a church isn't dependent upon our choice regarding a, a vaccine or the, or the short-term consequences of those choices, but upon the shed blood of Jesus. As I said once before, in the church of the living God, there is no place for us and them. There is no us and them, only us. Jesus didn't die just for you. And Jesus didn't die just for me. Jesus died for us. It's the us church that lies at the heart of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. He, he pleads with individuals not to think only as individuals. That stops the moment a person becomes a Christian. L listen again to what he says. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Did you hear him? <laughs> there is one body. There is one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. And there is one church. A body of believers, not, not lots of individuals all trying to get their own way. No, no, it's no longer my way, it's his way. The way of Jesus, the way of the cross, the way of service, the way of humility, the way of grace. Let me therefore, with that in mind, outline for you the restrictions placed upon communities and the possible short-term options available to God's church in the weeks ahead. Let's consider briefly the 70% threshold. Without going through all of the, the permutations, the government has ma mandated that vaccinated and unvaccinated can meet together in very limited numbers outdoors. Indoor gatherings, however, are not permitted. At 70%, government regulations allowing for vaccinated and unvaccinated to meet together are so minuscule that we would need to hold as many as 15 separate outdoor services on a Sunday to include everyone. It becomes even more problematic if we want to live stream whilst we conduct an outdoor service. And so what therefore are our options? Can we hold separate services, one for vaccinated, another for unvaccinated? Well, the simple answer is no. No, we cannot, not as the current rules stand. Unvaccinated are not allowed, under the restrictions imposed by this current government, to gather in sufficient and significant numbers, either indoors or outdoors. Not yet. And I ask you, would we want to do that anyway? To meet knowing that a brother or a sister was excluded? I don't think so. And I'll explain why in just a moment. And so let me share with you, with those of you who call Beaconsfield Baptist Church home, let me, let me take a moment to share with you where the leadership team is at. Let me share what we've been thinking and, and where we, we presently sit. It's in no way the final word, of course. It's just where we are currently sitting. And where we are currently sitting, can I just say, is, is not comfortable. Where we are currently sitting is really not where we want to be. Where we are currently sitting is in a place of humility before God, looking to him to guide us as his church, not as a group of individuals, not even as a group of two people, one group who are vaccinated and another group who aren't. What I can say is that the leadership team are standing 
as one. We are united in our common desire to move the church forward as one church. And so what does our united position presently look like? Well, at 70% fully vaccinated, a target the government believes Victoria will reach towards the end of October, we will continue as we are. As the expected time between 70% and 80% vaccination rates is only a, a matter of weeks, and the numbers allowed to meet outdoors are so very small, we feel our efforts should be directed at meeting the needs of the many rather than meeting the needs of the few. And so once we reach 70%, live streaming will continue whilst ever we are not physically meeting together as a community of faith. And we encourage people to continue to stay connected and to look out for one another. No one should be left thinking that they are on their own. As Rod and Mez have said, and as I have since adopted as my own, I and the leadership team are with you and for you. I and the leadership team are with you and for you. No one in this church family need think that they are on their own. Not now, not ever. At 80% fully vaccinated, the leadership team recommends that the church wait for a little while before considering a return to gathered assemblies. Just a while. And each week we will prayerfully consider our position. Initially, at 80%, the government regulations permit that no more than a total of around 100 people will be permitted to meet in a church our size. And no one who is unvaccinated will be allowed entry. The leadership team wrestled with this for some considerable time. We, we believe that, that turning unvaccinated men and women away from meeting with their brothers and sisters around the throne of Jesus is unconscionable. Who is going to be responsible for turning people away? Me? Stephen? Rod? You, perhaps. It's not that we don't want to meet as soon as we can. It's not that we don't want to open up. It's, it's that we don't want to say no to anyone who wants to meet with God's people but cannot do so because of their vaccination status. And so live streaming will continue whilst ever we are not physically meeting together as a community of faith. For our part, the leadership team has committed themselves to meet every week via Zoom to review where things are at and change course if and as necessary, to pray together and to seek to hear from God together. Church, that's our commitment to you. At 80%, we are hopeful that the restrictions placed upon the unvaccinated will soon be lifted so that we are able to meet as a community of believers which excludes no one on the grounds of their vaccination status. Now, there is a chance that the rules will remain in place for some time to come. Just how long, we don't know. And so we want to move cautiously and we want to move prayerfully. We believe that the gathering of God's people is not a nice-to-have service, but is in fact a key aspect of what it is that constitutes the church of the living God. From its inception, the church has stopped on the Lord's Day to gather and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Now, we need to accept that a, that a secular government has no way of understanding that meeting as God's people is just an optional extra. That is not merely something we like to do. Meeting as God's people around the throne of the living God is a, is a deeply held belief that gets to the very core of, of who it is that we are. Is that not true? When we are unable to meet, it affects us profoundly. There is a part of us that, that grieves. We feel it emotionally and even physically. We certainly feel it spiritually, don't we? I certainly do. Now, a secular government cannot possibly understand that. And so we need to cut them some slack, don't we? And we need to pray for them. We also believe that the elected government has been raised up by God. And because that is so, we freely submit to the governing authorities. And we see a great many examples of this played out in the Word of God. And, and 
therefore, in the history of the world. Consider Moses. Now, Moses didn't leave Egypt with God's people until Pharaoh allowed him to leave. Certainly, God was going to make it clear to Pharaoh that he had no choice, but, but Pharaoh was appointed by God. And Moses waited until Pharaoh relented. And then, of course, there's Jesus. Even Jesus submitted to the ruling power. You would have no power over me unless it was given you by God. That's what Jesus said. He submitted to a rule that was corrupt and self-serving. Now, there are going to be some laws that God's people will choose not to submit to. That is also true. Just as the midwives refused to follow Pharaoh's orders and kill every male baby. Just as the apostles disobeyed the Jewish leaders who, who ordered them to cease to proclaim the gospel. Just as Daniel refused to bow down to the gold statue and instead prayed to the God of Israel. But Christians also need to be careful not to read into scripture that which isn't there. The scriptures make it clear that we are to meet together. Do not forsake meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Now, it seems clear enough, doesn't it? If you are a Christian and you have found yourself choosing to stay in bed or enjoying a morning walk or prepare the Sunday lunch rather than stopping to meet with other Christians, then this scripture speaks to you. But it doesn't necessarily apply to the current situation, does it? Not easily anyway. You see, I want to meet. And I know that you also, you want to meet. In fact, I know you do. You love your church family. And you love Jesus. And so we're not forsaking the meeting together, are we? That's not our habit. It's not our bent. It's not our way. And so not being able to meet is not the same as not wanting to meet, not bothering to meet because we have something better to do. When Christians decide to practice civil disobedience as choosing to meet together under the current laws would be, it must always be the exception and never the rule. Now, to be sure, as I've just said, there will be exceptions. But church, is this it? I don't think it is. And the leadership team doesn't think so. Not yet. Not yet. And so whilst ever some can meet and some can't, we think it better to suffer together and continue to wrestle a little bit longer. Just a little bit longer. Just a while. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26 says, If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. We are to suffer, aren't we, with those who suffer. And if the ma government mandates that one group of people can meet, but another group cannot, regardless of the reasons that people find themselves in a particular group, it's reasonable, I think, and the leadership team also thinks, to choose to suffer together, to choose to suffer alongside those who suffer. If I am excluded from participating, Paul, I think, would choose to willingly suffer alongside me. If the ruling authority says that I cannot meet with my neighbour, even for defensible reasons, Paul, I think, would choose to suffer with me. The world may not understand that. But we do understand that, don't we? We understand that, church, because the God who made us chose to suffer alongside us. He could have stood far off. He could have chosen to, to let us try to, to work it out ourselves. He could have said, that's their problem. But he didn't do that. What did he do? He chose to suffer with those who suffer. You made your choice to sin. You chose to move away from God. You decided to be your own God. As for me, well, I'm going to stay with the Father. Jesus could have said that. He could have. But he didn't. He chose instead to suffer. He suffered with those who suffer. 
The second half of that verse reminds us that, that once this season is over, we can all look forward to rejoicing. If we suffer together as a community, we can look forward to rejoicing together as a community. Won't that be something to look forward to? Won't that be something to celebrate? Secondly, as Christians, we are to defer to the weak. And it's true that there will be people in both camps who unfortunately look at those in the other camp as weak. Now, I say unfortunate because, as I've said on numerous occasions, there really isn't two camps, just people who hold different opinions, different views, informed by different voices. And the truth is, we all have different fears, don't we? We all have different tolerances, all have different histories. And those different histories will sometimes have an effect upon the choices we make, both as individuals and as families. And in all of this, Paul says that you and I are to defer to the weak in order that the community is built up in faith and not tor torn down. And so for the sake of my brother and sister who isn't vaccinated, and they, for my sake, we will defer for their benefit, not demanding our rights. Me for theirs and they for mine. I would ask, therefore, that as God's people who have been joined to the community of faith in this place, I would ask that we show grace to one another. Let us not be like the world. Let us not look questionably at the choices that people make. Let us not make this a moral issue. I would plead with God's people to pray for your leaders Pray for the government and also for the elders and for the whole leadership team as we wrestle with the questions that have been put before us. I would ask you to bear with us just a little bit longer than perhaps you would like. I would ask you to suffer with those who cannot meet as they would like. And that means that we all suffer and we do it together. And as this season passes, as it most assuredly will pass, we can all look forward to rejoicing together. One church serving one God, looking forward to the return and rule of the one king in an eternal kingdom. Now please know, church, that my door is always open. Know that you can, you can call me at any time, any time, if you feel you need to talk. If you have questions, please don't be afraid to ask them. And please feel free to e email the leadership team with any thoughts and with any concerns that you might have. Not only questions, any concerns that you have. Carl, Ashton, David Croft and David Muir, Stephen, Rod and myself, we welcome your views and we value your insights. We really do. Know too that just as you have questions and concerns, we also have questions and concerns. Know that Stephen and Rod and myself, we have questions and concerns. Know that Ashton and Carl and David's Croft and Muir, they have questions and concerns. But we also trust. We don't have all the answers. But we know that God most certainly does. And so we trust. And we are wrestling at the same time. And so pray for us. Please, would you do that? We are continuing to wrestle with this problem. We think it is a problem. But we don't think it has a simple answer. We are flexible. But we are concerned also that those we lead be led well. And we are concerned that God is honoured. Pray also for one another. Would you do that? Continue to look out for one another. Pray for the church that as we navigate the weeks ahead, that we will do so knowing that God is in control, knowing that God has never lost control, and look forward with me to once again being able to gather around the throne of the living God in the not-too-distant future. Not as those who have been vaccinated, not as those who haven't, but as one church bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father God, we do thank you that you have saved your church. You have brought us together to be one people, not 
separate groups. And Lord, my prayer is that you might hold us firm and that we might be determined to, to walk the distance, to persevere, and that we might at the end of this rejoice with great celebration, knowing that you have held us together, that knowing that you have brought us through this, this, this valley that we didn't even know was coming two years ago. And Lord, my prayer is that we as a church, when we, when we do meet, we, we, our rejoicing is, is just so, so great that the people round about us would ask themselves, what on earth is happening in that place? So Lord, bless us all. Give to us wisdom and grace. May your leadership team have wisdom that goes far beyond the worldly wisdom. And Lord, in all of this, may you receive all of the praise and all of the glory and all of the honour that is due your name. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.